F40 along with the F50 Enzo and LaFerrari seen here is one of Ferrari's crown jewels, one of the most iconic, celebrated, exhilarating road cars ever made, regularly voted the greatest supercar of all time. And with a string of famous original owners like Pink Floyd's Nick Mason, Nigel Mansell, Sylvester Stallone, and even Italian footballer Roberto Baggio. The stage presence of this magnificent machine built to celebrate Ferrari's 40th anniversary is palpable. It's a signature moment in the company's history, its shape is instantly recognisable, and it offers genuine driving thrills and enjoyment, and it is unconventionally, undeniably beautiful. This week I'll be going into forensic detail with this car. We will look at its features, the exterior, the interior, the highs, the lows, the history, and I'll be driving it and reminding myself what it's like to live with one of these increasingly valuable behemoths. This is Drive Every Ferrari, and of course, this is the Ferrari F40. At last, we have an F40 on Drive Every Ferrari, which gives me the excuse to tell its story in detail and drink in all those exquisite touches that make this car so revered in Ferrari circles. The F40 is one of those Ferraris that only a complete idiot would ever own and then sell. And fortunately, the owner of this car and friend of the car guys, Andrew, has kept his. He is a very clever man. I get it. I can feel you judging me. That's palpable. If you've never stood next to an F40 before, then perhaps you don't realize just what an event it is. That gargantuan fixed rear wing, the racing derived knacker ducks on the rear haunches and bonnet or hood, how low it is, how wide it appears, the stripped out racing interior, industrial looking split rims, and the front and rear opening clamshell sections that make it look like an insect about to take flight. It's an orgy of functional shapes, ducts, contours, and outrageous details draped over a basic but effective racing underpinning. I think it's the most distinctive Ferrari ever made. It's related to the 288 GTO, my grail car, and it stops people in their tracks wherever you drive it. And despite what you may have been told about what an animal this car is like to drive, in fact, the F40 is a pussycat, and it only really flashes its teeth and claws when you provoke it. But uh, more about that later. And I would be remiss if I didn't also point out the episode on the car guys made on the F40 earlier in the life of the channel, which will be the perfect companion to this one. The F40 was announced on the 21st of July, 1987, at the Civic Center in Maranello. Here it is. 40 years after Enzo Ferrari began constructing cars on the 12th of March 1947, it was the last car to carry Enzo's signature and it was built from 1988 to 1992. The shape was a complete surprise to the gathered audience and unlike today, absolute secrecy was observed lest face the wrath of Mr. Ferrari. Codenamed F120A, work began on the engine of the F40 in June 1986 as a development of the 288 GTO Evolutioni's eight-cylinder twin-turbo unit. The head of the project was Nicola Materazzi, the mechanical engineering genius who worked on the engines of the Lancia Stratos, the Testarossa, the 288 GTO, and Evolutioni. Not to mention the 328 Turbo and, crucially, the 126 Formula One cars. And in later years, he also oversaw the Bugatti EB110, so you can probably tell that Materazzi was an expert on turbo engines and therefore the perfect man for Project 120A. Materazzi sadly died in 2022, aged 83. This episode of Drive Every Ferrari, therefore, is dedicated to him. Once the car was shown to the group of Ferrari VIPs, the orders began flooding in, which presented somewhat of a problem. Ferrari only planned to make 400 cars, but such was the demand, it was clear that this number was going to have to increase a lot. 
Deliveries began in 1988 to a who's who of 1980s stars, including Sylvester Stallone, Rod Stewart, Dave Gilmore and Nick Mason of band Pink Floyd, not to mention a host of racing drivers, including Clay Regazzoni, Michael Schumacher and Alain Prost. The F40 set a 200 mile an hour benchmark for modern supercars, and as a consequence, it adorned the bedroom walls of an entire generation of schoolboy petrol heads. Running alongside the road F40s were the F40 LMs, an even more extreme track variant developed by Michelotto for racing in the IMSA class in the USA and Global GT Endurance class in Europe. By the end of production in 1992, over 1,300 had been manufactured and a large number still exist 30 years later. Values were stagnant up until 2018-2019 when they began to dramatically increase and cars, which were 800,000 then, are now touching £2 million. Ferrari followed it up with the F50 Enzo and LaFerrari. All are lusted after in equal measure, all are rare and all are now extremely expensive, putting them out of the reach of the majority of car collectors. Fortunately, many owners, like Andrew, still take them out and enjoy them and exhibit them at car shows for all to see. The silhouette is unmistakably F40 and if I'm being honest, gives me the right horn. The overall shape of the F40 was another piece of genius by the designer at Pininfarina, Leonardo Fioravanti, and it also benefited with extensive wind tunnel testing to hone the shape and to maximize top speed and aerodynamics. That upright rear angled rear wing though, that was created by Fioravanti's colleague Aldo Bravaroni. And you'll note that F40 is only on the one side of the wing because on the other side it would be reversed and Enzo wouldn't like that. To reduce the weight, every body panel of the F40 and the firewall is made of Kevlar, Nomex and carbon fibre composite materials, with a core bonded to a tubular steel chassis. You can see the distinctive green glue in the cabin, and that means the entire rear clamshell, which can be opened to reveal the engine, a third of the car, is just 22 kilograms, and the enormous front lid is just 18 kilograms. Given the size of each piece, that is extraordinary. This gives an overall weight saving of 20% over steel and it's exceptionally strong, but the downside is that it cannot be repaired. It must be replaced at great expense. And with no bumpers at all, you've got to be careful. And it's all thanks to Ferrari's composite experience gained in Formula One development. This 1983 126C3 F1 car has a complete carbon fiber body and it's been the same ever since. The rear screen and sliding side windows on early cars are made of a plastic called Lexan, again to save weight. The rear screen is open to the elements thanks to these 12 cutout sections that vent as much heat as possible from the engine. And this was recently brought back by Ferrari for the F8 Tributo as a homage to this car. A little known fact incidentally is that this windscreen is identical to the Ferrari 328. The beautiful shiny split rims are instantly recognisable as coming from the F40. The wheels on this car are 17 inches and they hide 330mm lightweight aluminium and iron brake discs that offer prodigious unassisted stopping power, which means you don't even need to stamp on them that hard to be effective. One of the things I really like about the F40 is that you actually have two fuel fillers, one on each side of the car. They're a little bit tricky to get into, but at least it gets rid of that anxiety as you go into a petrol station over which side you have to fill up on. With this, doesn't matter. Famously, the F40 features two bladder-like deformable fuel tanks, giving a capacity of 26.4 gallons, which is 120 litres. This was the first time that such tanks were used on a road car, and unfortunately, they need to be replaced every 10 years, resulting in a decent-sized bill. When these cars were worth £200,000, that bill looked ridiculous, but now they're touching 10 times that, it's not so bad. Seeing this car's famous 32-valve longitudinal engine can be, let's be honest, a bit of a chore, and one that can become quite dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. And for goodness sake, don't try and open it when it's windy. It can be done by one person, but to be honest, it's better with two or four. But since I'm here on my own, I'm gonna demonstrate how to open the rear clamshell of a Ferrari F40. You've got two latches here, which you use a little tiny key in order to open. So you pull those down, you push down slightly as you pull them out. That allows them to pop up. What you have to do then is you have to lift up all oh, the rear clam there you go, this one is particularly heavy. 
you have to lift it up like that, up into the middle position. Then down here, we've got a two stage sort of stick, which you need to lock in place. And then you move and put it into this little receptacle right here. And then you let the weight come down onto that stick. So it seems quite fragile, but fortunately, it is quite strong. It does hold it in place and there's enough flex. If there is a bit of wind, you're not going to get in trouble straight away. And there you go. That is the engine of the F40. You can't quite believe it until you see one in the flesh. It is vast and it is awe-inspiring. I have to say, I absolutely love the view of the F40 when you've got that rear clamshell up because not only can you appreciate the size of the engine, but you can also appreciate the thickness of the tires. It is this view that to me makes it look the most like the Chris Nolan Batmobile. I mean, just look, just look at them. Look at the width. You can see the tread there with the two different tread patterns. There's no other view like this in motoring. This is where it just looks like a Le Mans car for the road. It's absolute fabulous. This is pure theater, pure drama, pure shock and awe. As you can see, the build quality and finishing on an F40 is not quite the sort of thing you would expect on a super expensive two million pound road car. It is, of course, pure race bread technology, which means that it's not really finished at all. There's bare composite all over the place. There's this sort of foil they put on that's heat resistant material. Uh, to stop the car catching fire and to reduce heat. And you've got various shields and guards, again, to try and keep the car cool, to try and stop various components overheating. This car's got the standard air boxes on it, whereas you can get those in carbon fiber. But certainly if you're expecting your two million pound Ferrari F40 to be finished with all the precision, say, of a Pagani, uh, you're gonna be pretty disappointed. But if you want your cars feeling as if they've literally just pulled into the pits at Le Mans, then the F40 is just what you're looking for. If you are brave enough to poke your head and fleshy exposed neck into the engine bay, you can marvel at this car's three litre 2936cc to be exact V8, which is supplemented by two IHI water-cooled turbochargers to give 400 and 78 brake horsepower, which is 485 PS, and generate 424 foot-pounds of torque, which is 576 newton meters. The F40's 0-60 time of 4.5 seconds might not sound much by modern standards, with newer cars regularly breaching the three-second mark. But back in 1988, when these babies first took to the road, it was more than sufficient. And because the F40 does not write checks with its looks that its performance cannot cash, this is the first member of the 200 mile an hour club, something that I still can't quite believe given how terrifying an F40 feels at 120 miles an hour. And as we will find out when I drive this car, it is the way the power is delivered that makes the F40 so intoxicating and so special. Part of the reason why the F40 engine runs so well and is so manageable at low speeds is thanks to the Weber Morelli electrics, which regulate the boost pressure and fuel injection. You get eight individually controlled butterfly valves, one for each cylinder, a four coil ignition system, and eight spark plugs. And the engine was developed from the GTO Evolutioni program, which resulted in the previous car, the 288 GTO, effectively the development mule for the F40. Engine weight was under particular scrutiny, which meant extensive uses of magnesium for the likes of the oil sump, cylinder head covers, intake manifolds, and gearbox housing. Incredibly expensive compared to aluminium, but worth it in terms of the overall weight saving at the rear center of the car. It's a five-speed manual gearbox with a dual plate dry hydraulic clutch, and it's kept on the road by independent front and rear wishbone suspension, coil springs, and Coney hydraulic shock absorbers. The steering is rack and pinion, and of course, it's unassisted for maximum feel. This car you can see clearly is the catalytic converter one and also it is the lift one which can raise and lower the ride height. Old time wisdom would have told you that the best cars to have are the non-cat non-adjusts, i.e. the early cars. There were also cars in the middle which had catalytic converters 
and no height adjustment. And then like this car, there are those at the end with cats and ride height adjustment. Now, depending on where you buy the car from and depending on who you buy the car from and what car they've got in stock, you will get three different answers as to which are the best cars. Old school wisdom says non-cat, non-adjust. But in modern days, wouldn't you rather have a bit of ride height action going on? Who knows? A lot of purists do believe that the non-cat cars are the rawest and therefore the best. But let's face it, in my eyes, every F40 is the best. Here we are then at the front of the car. And again, we use the tiny, tiny key uh, on these here in order to open it up. So you insert the key and I always find push down slightly just to make it that much easier to turn it. One on this side, one on this side. There we go. Then you pop those out into the out position like that. And then you oh, lift open the front. As you can see, there's a bit of string there to stop it flipping all the way forward. This is the frunk, the front boot or trunk where you can store some stuff. You could store a spare wheel possibly, or more likely you can put your bags in here. Look at the size of this composite bonnet. Absolutely incredible. You also get to see the rear workings of all of those vents and ducts right here, which fire cold air through to cool the brakes. Uh, in this case, you also get to see the suspension components there and you get to see the radiator and fans. And this is one of the greatest views in the car world. Look at that, ladies and gentlemen, a fully open Ferrari F40. Now you see what I mean about an insect taking flight. Now let's look at the cockpit of the F40, see what all the fuss is about. Little tiny lifty up latch to open an F40. Door is incredibly light, only weighs one and a half kilograms. And uh, just look, just look at the cockpit. The first thing you need to bear in mind about an F40 is you've got an enormous sill. You've got a big body piece here, and then you also have this piece of structural composite to get over as well. So it's quite an art form getting into an F40. What you need to do is put one leg deep into the footwell, pivot, bum down into the seat, and then turn and you are there. This is it then. I cannot believe I'm back inside the cockpit of a Ferrari F40. Now, regular viewers of the channel will know this is a bit of a trip down memory lane. Um, so I will best describe Andrew's car if I can. First thing to notice is that these are leather seats. They are not that sort of foamy material that you get on pretty much everything. I am told that the foam actually is underneath these and that these leathers are just something that goes over the top, but it does make this car stand out and actually probably should have been an option at the time. Second thing you really notice is just how stripped out and bare this car is, as you would expect. It is, of course, a race car for the road and it was built using race technology. So we've got huge amounts of carbon fiber and composites making up the entire cockpit area. This whole passenger safety cell is made out of carbon, all of course designed originally for Formula One. So real form Formula One technology coming into road cars. You can see the very obvious green bonding uh, where they glued these pieces together, but you've also got steel struts around the place, proper business-like racing cab in this, incredibly bare. You've got the dashboard has got this Alcantara material all over it, very few controls, obviously nothing on the steering wheel at all, apart from the horn in the center. This steering wheel is non-standard, it's slightly smaller than the regular one, and it's got red around the outside, which I particularly like. You've got a manual handbrake, of course, and in the center, we have that thing of wonder, the Ferrari manual gearbox with this H pattern gate here in steel. This one's of course a dog leg. So first gear is down and to the left. You've got second straight ahead, third straight back, and then over into fourth and fifth, five gear box with reverse over in the top left. Once it's warmed up, it is absolutely beautiful to use and it always retains a mechanical feel. So it really feels like you're operating a well-oiled machine. It's one of the all time great Ferrari gearboxes, in my opinion, because of course it is trying desperately to harness 
all that turbo power. Now, just like the special series V8 Ferraris that you'll have seen in the series, you've got carbon fiber in it as well. So the door cards are all carbon fiber and you've got just basically a piece of wire to open and close the doors. It just hangs down, lolls down inside that gap and uh, you give it a good old tug in order to open the doors. And for all you millennials out there who may never have seen one of these before, over here we have a control which is used to wind and unwind the windows by hand, not electrically. Look, you twist it round and the window goes down and then you do it the other way and it goes up. Incredible, isn't it? But importantly, it doesn't go wrong. To my left, I've got four buttons here in the dashboard, easily to hand. The first one is for the suspension, because of course this is an adjustable suspension car. So I'm not gonna mess around with that, but I'm told that you can make it go up quite far down to a medium, which is what it's on now, or you can slam it properly down on the ground, which I'm not gonna do because I'm 50. You've also got fog lights, a heated rear screen and headlight washers. You've got the hazard warning lights, which is in a button exactly the same as the button you would press to start a nuclear war. And over on the right side, we have the position for the key and you have the starter button, which has no drama or flair about it whatsoever. It literally looks like a licorice all sort or a gumdrop. And you just push that thing and magic happens. These seats are perfect. They hug you in all the right places. You've got four point racing harnesses, which of course enhances the feeling that you're going out racing. They're bolted to the back here and uh, there's all sorts of pipe work. And of course the view out the back to the engine, which from the driver's seat, you can see the Lexan rear screen and all of those louvres, which make it just impossible to see anything behind you. In fact, the only thing that you can see is that enormous wing, that enormous wing. Three drilled pedals, obviously, to save weight. It's a manual car after all. The accelerator pedal over on the right is very tight indeed. Those with big wide feet need not apply because you're just not going to get your foot down there to press it. But plenty of room for the clutch and for the brake. And I'm quite glad for that because you really need to press the brake. Ahead of me, we've got four dials and various warning indicators. So you've got temperature over on the left. You've got the main speedo, which goes up to 220 miles an hour. This car has done 19,000 miles. Then over to the right, we've got the rev counter and we've got the turbo boost gauge. Main thing you have to worry about with an F40 cockpit is the slowdown light. When that starts blinking, slow down a lot. Over in the middle, we've got other temperature gauges and of course the fuel level. And just below them, you've got quite the worst, most imprecise, horrible controls for the fan and for the air and temperature. They feel completely insubstantial. They feel like they're gonna fall off all the time and you're never quite sure if they're actually connected to anything. And then further over to the right, we've got a new addition for this car, the fire suppression system, which you really do want in an F40 because seeing one of these go up in an oil fire is like watching Piper Alpha or Deepwater Horizon. But that's pretty much it in an F40. It's stripped out, it's bare, it's workmanlike, it's fantastic. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait to take this out for a drive. So startup procedure on an F40, relatively simple. Put the key in, twist it till all the lights come on and you can hear the fans and then push this starter button. Clutch is quite heavy by the way, 
and the bike point takes a little bit getting used to, but once you are, all the pedals are quite chunky. You can feel all of that potential sitting there. The car is saying, please David, make me go much faster, make me go much faster, please. turbochargers they've got some punch let me tell you let me tell you look at this pitching into a corner totally flat i know exactly what i'm doing in the steering the whole car is fully composed we're on a hot day we've got big hot new rubber this thing is unstickable now many of you i appreciate will not have driven an f40 before so let me describe it to you it's very loud it's very firm and bouncy it feels like it's got a very wide chassis on it and the way it absorbs bumps is quite strange it feel there's a lot of sort of lateral movement to it the steering wheel is exactly the same angle as a go-kart it's perfectly weighted so that you know exactly what the wheels are doing as you enter corners it's really important when you've got this much rubber to know what it's doing and to know whether you're going to run out of traction and um yeah, the F40 just gives you all the information you need to make sure you stay on the black stuff. Because it's unassisted, it's just directly connected to those enormous Batmobile tyres. So I can just feel everything, but at the same time I can drive the car quite fingertippy, which is an odd sensation. You feel quite low to the ground, because of course you are. But front visibility is good, wing mirror visibility is pretty good, rear visibility eh, not so much because the vents in the Lexan unfortunately make it quite hard to see through. But actually, apart from the strut and the Lexan, I can almost see out of it. Everything is drama, everything is designed to assault every one of your senses all at once. You'll notice I'm having to speak closely to the microphone because obviously it is loud in here. Now for those of you watching in the United States of America, you will not believe that we drive on roads this narrow with cars like this, but trust me, we do. But the thing that is immediately apparent is that you are driving something very important, something wonderful. On these sort of roads, the camber is pulling me all over the place, so you have to keep your eyes and your wits about you to make sure you stay on the road. But that's part of the fun of an F40. It's all constantly buzzing and fizzing and darting everywhere. You've got to really be on your A game to keep control of one of these things. But when you're used to it, it really is a simple car to drive. It's not that intimidating at all. I was more intimidating driving the 512M, to be honest, than this car. And the dials up ahead, well, they're quite legible, but to be honest, with all the jiggling around and the fact that they're quite small and detailed, you don't really pay much attention to the dials. You pay attention to the warning lights, that's what you pay attention to. It's a very easy car to drive at low speeds. You don't have to constantly keep it going, keep it on the boil. It's, it's quite happy to just chug around town and then when you get to an open road like this, you can pop down the gears and away you go. I can't tell you how special it feels being back in one of these cars. There is just something magical about them. Yes, of course, the pedal box is quite small particularly for your accelerator. That is a tiny area. Sometimes it feels like your leg's gonna get caught in there and you're not gonna be able to take your foot off the accelerator. But actually, because they are so well positioned, it makes heel and toeing to ease the gear changes that much easier, like this. Oh yeah, you see, perfect. The pedal position seems like it's gonna be cramped, seems like it makes no sense, but actually, it makes all the sense in the world. Do you think it's time for some beans? I think it might be. Some Ferrari F40 beans are required. Let's see what this car can do. So I'm in second gear right now, which is forward in this car. Let's see what happens when we give it some beans. It's a good job that the 
the brakes are strong on this car because it accelerates like nothing else. You put your foot down, nothing really happens. Slight noise somewhere behind you, and then it girds its loins, it gets quicker, you can feel something building, you can feel the skies grow darker, there's electricity in the air, and then boom! This thing just takes off. Ferrari F40 is unquestionably iconic, historic, unique, deeply exciting and increasingly valuable. It has all the supercar ingredients that make small children giddy with excitement when one passes by. Namely outrageous looks, a huge wing, a throaty exhaust note. <laughs> It's low, it's wide, looks entirely out of place on normal roads. It has racing harnesses, it's festooned with vents and grills and ducts, and of course, that badge. But you know what? It's easy to drive. The mechanicals are simple apart from the turbos and even they can be reconditioned. And as long as you don't crash into anything or need new fuel tanks or suspension components, F40 ownership costs are modest and running one isn't actually that ruinous. And that makes it pretty much the perfect Ferrari in my eyes. Thank you for watching this episode of Drive Every Ferrari on the Ferrari F40. A big thanks to owner Andrew, who's a friend of the Car Guys, for loaning me this car today. If you like what we're doing on the Car Guys, please subscribe, leave comments and likes, and there'll be another episode next week.